you got a part in today's service, meet up front so we can pray together. Ivan. Josh. Josh Smith. He's talking. Good morning, new song. It's great to see you this morning. Welcome, come on in, have a seat. If you're out in the hallway for you still, welcome you to come on in. And as we begin our worship time in just a moment, I'm glad to see you today. It's a good day. I'm thankful to be here with you. Uh, God is good. Jesus reigns. He's, re he's resurrected. He is risen. And uh, he's, he's seated in power at the right hand of God the Father. So we rejoice and we are going to worship him today because he's worthy. And I'm glad that you're here and, uh, and that we get to worship together. A lot of you have seen the news over the overnight, especially as the nation of Israel was subjected to hundreds of drones and missiles attacking uh, their nation. We're going uh, we're gonna to pray for them. Uh, we, we keep in our minds a lot of people all over the world that are under uh, under attack militarily and, and in other ways. Uh, continue to pray for Ukraine and the, and the war that they're facing. Uh, and we want to lift up uh, Israel after Iran has attacked them uh, today. We're thankful for the protection that was provided uh, by our nation and others as well, uh, assisting in that, and thankful that damage was, uh, was limited to a great extent from what it could have been. But we're going to pray for them uh, later in our prayer time as well, and I encourage you to, to pray for them. I'm thankful that we don't have to fear those kinds of attacks, uh, but for people that are, you can imagine uh, or try to imagine what, what that would be like and what they're going through. So lift them up in prayer. Keep them on your, on your mind as you, uh, as you watch the news, hear, hear about the headlines and things that are going on. But I'm glad that you're here today. Jesus, uh, Jesus is still in charge. 
and he's still worthy. So we get to lift, lift him up. Uh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we worship him today. Uh, and, uh, and we're about to do that together. I'm going to give you an update on our Annie Armstrong total in just a little while as well. We're going to have some times of scripture reading, prayer together, fellowship, and of, and of course, preaching in God's word uh, as we see Jesus appear to two disciples on the road to Emmaus from the Gospel of Luke today. So look forward to what God is going to do, how he's going to speak to all of us through his word uh, and through his people. All right? I encourage you to worship with me today. Let's stand together. Good morning, everybody. Let's worship. I believe there's one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe. Crucifixion by his blood, I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is destined. All praise, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. Preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Ears have heard or eyes have seen I believe that day is coming He's returning to claim his bride Light the altar, keep it burning See the Lamb who rose a roaring Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I'll never be ashamed. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Yeah, yeah. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. All praise. And all praise to God our Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus. 
Jesus' mighty name, I believe. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe. Good morning, Esau. Uh, my name is Ivan, and I have the honor and privilege of reading the Old Testament scripture, uh, which will be found in Psalm 118, and we will be reading from verses 15 through 24. Uh, it is on page 495 of the Church Bibles. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted up. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous, I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day let us rejoice today and be glad. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, New Song. My name is Ernie, and it is my privilege to uh, lead us all in prayer. If anybody would like to come up to pray in the stairs, please do so. You want to play in sm pray in small groups in your chairs, that's fine. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes of silent prayer, and then at the end I will close us out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for so many blessings that you have upon this country. Thank you for the protection that our military provided us, for the police, the firefighters, all the first responders out there, Lord. Lord, our hearts are heavy as our brothers and sisters are being attacked, whether in Ukraine or in Israel or other places around the world. Lord, whatever weapons man comes up with, the power of prayer is much, much stronger. So, Lord, we lift up prayer protection around those. We lift up the, our nation in prayer. We pray individually for our families and for our friends. Lord, continue to bless this nation. Lift up our president and our leaders in this country. Pray, Lord, for peace in this country. I pray also for peace in our church as we worship the 
awesome creator of the universe. I thank you that you are our friend. Lord Jesus, continue to bless this service and bless us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, I want to dismiss kindergarten through third graders for Kids Church. We're about at that time. But before I do that, I want to give you an update on our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, this season, every year, our church takes up an offering to support the North American Mission Board and the work that they do. Our church goal this season has been $5,000. And I wanted to update you that as of this past Sunday... We have received $4,777 toward that goal. So I want to say a huge thank you and congratulations toward being so close to reaching our goal. There's still time to give. If you haven't given yet and would like to, please feel free to, to add just a little bit to that total, and maybe we will even uh, surpass it. But we, we've done a great job and glad to be able to send those funds to the North, North American Mission Board very soon. So great job. Thank you guys very much for helping us with that. And now for Kids Church, I'm going to let our workers get a head start. Oh, Ryan and Ron heading out. Going to be a good, good Kids Church lesson today, I can tell. All right, kindergarten through third graders, now is the time. You can... Head that way. Oh, do we have a birthday girl going out to kids' church today? Yeah. <laughs> Let's all give Stella a hand. Congratulations, Miss Stella. Happy birthday. All right. I think we're ready. Let's keep worshiping. church. We're going to sing Sea of Victory and that no weapon can be formed against us because we've got Jesus. Amen.
take what the enemy meant for evil. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Sing it out. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm going to see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for evil you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You turn it around. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Whoa. to worship and we realize that you are our cornerstone the thing that we rely on the thing that we stand on God you are the truth the way and the life and God we give you praise this morning we lift our hands we raise our voices in worship to you in Jesus name amen darkness 
seems When darkness seems to hide his face And I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Yeah, I told you you were going to have to do it. All right, back it up, back it up. I always up. forget when there's some somebody else is supposed to go first. I told him to push me off the stage, but he's too nice. The other option is he does the reading and I do the sermon. No, we don't want that. We don't want that. So, good morning, New Song. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Our New Testament reading is coming from Second First Corinthians, uh, fifteen. Uh, verses 14 through 26. If you have your Bibles, you can follow with me. I don't have a church Bible with me, so you have to figure out the page yourself. But it's right before 2 Corinthians. You'll find it. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 26. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death... By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. The hope of the resurrection is everything to us. I love the passage from 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, if Jesus hasn't been raised, then we are still in our sins. We have no hope. We are more to be pitied than all men, but if Christ has been raised, then he has defeated every enemy. 
And one day, he will put a final, a final defeat on the last enemy, enemy to be defeated, which is death. And we can look forward to that day in confidence that because Jesus came out of the tomb, that that victory is all but accomplished. I invite you to open up to me, open up with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we're continuing our series called Risen on the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Last week, we saw the very first appearance of the risen Christ to Mary Magdalene in the garden after she returned a second time. Today, we're going to see Jesus appear to two disciples, only one of whom we know the name, and we don't know much about him at that, but two disciples as they walk on the road to Emmaus, a small village about seven miles from Jerusalem. So I invite you to turn there. Luke chapter 24 is where we are and will be this morning as we see this uh, pretty incredible exchange and appearance that happened that only Luke records for us. We have to go to Luke's gospel to, to read about this, to hear about it. Uh, but it's an amazing story, and I think you'll really enjoy getting to hear how Jesus appeared and what he said to these two disciples. Let's get started in verse 13. It says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Well, let's pause there to set the scene a little bit, right? Last week, I explained to you that a number of Jesus' appearances, for some reason, it's not clear to the people he's appearing to that this actually is Jesus. We don't know why that is. We don't know if his physical appearance changed somewhat or possibly changed notably, we don't know if it was some kind of spiritual blindness or confusion that God supernaturally uh, worked out so that people wouldn't recognize him at first and then would come to the realization. We don't know exactly what it is. The text here says they were kept from recognizing him, which makes it sound more like something that God s prevented them from for a certain amount of time from re realizing that it was Jesus. To set the scene for today... For today's message, I want you to realize, number one, that this is the same day that the empty tomb was found. This was the first Easter Sunday. when, As we're trying to work chronologically through the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, first we saw Jesus appear to Mary Magdalene, right, that first Easter morning. This is the very same day, okay? We, are, we have not moved off of the first Easter Sunday yet, and we've still got more next week. We have a lot that happens the very first day of Jesus' resurrection. It says, now that same day, and it's going to be confirmed again later in the passage too as we go, but we'll, let's leave it there for now. Now this, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. And when I started off this week, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get a map and I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to show you where Emmaus is. But then as I did some research this week, I found out nobody knows where Emmaus is. <laughs> so I can't give you a map. I could show you where Jerusalem is on a map, but nobody knows where Emmaus is. There are a few different options that some scholars have suggested, but none of them seems to fully make sense. Uh, some of them are actually farther than seven miles away. Some of them would be half the distance, so the suggestion is, well, maybe it was the seven miles was the round trip instead of the seven-mile distance. The reality is that we're just not sure. There are a lot of very small villages that were just lost archaeologically to history, and we don't know exactly where they were, what the names were, those kinds of things. So small town or village called Emmaus that was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and this is where they were traveling. They were probably from Emmaus and had traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover and then were, uh, had seen all of the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and now they were returning. And as they return, they're talking with each other. So who are these two disciples? You hear the word disciples, and your mind immediately goes to the 11, who would previously have been called the 12, but now Judas is no longer with them, so just quote the 11. But how, 
we do find out the name of one of these disciples, and it's not one of the 11. So we're not sure if the second one was one of the 11, but I think most likely not, because the others had been traveling with him all through Galilee for, for some time. We don't have any indication that any of them were from this village called Emmaus. So we do find out in verse 18, I'll, we'll, we'll just skip down there for a second, it says, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these days? So we know one of them was named Cleopas, but we don't know the name of the other one. We don't know much about Cleopas, but we, he was likely from Emmaus. Not much more other than that. So here's some of the suggestions about who it could have been. Some have suggested it's the Apostle Peter, one of the 11. Some have thought that it may be. Some of that stems from a tradition, an early church tradition that says the other traveler with Cleopas, his name was Simon. Now, we don't know if that's true or not. It, like I said, it's an early church tradition. Within the first two to 300 years of the church, we have writings from church fathers indicating that. So that may well be a reliable tradition. We just, we, we're not sure about that. So people have reasoned, well, if the name of this disciple was Simon, maybe it was Simon Peter. Because we actually do find out in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that Jesus, the resurrected Christ, did appear to Peter. He makes that a separate emphasis from the other disciples. So there is an appearance to the apostle Peter shortly after Jesus' resurrection. We do know that. And we don't have another recorded appearance in any of the Gospels of a, an appearance specifically to Peter. So, some have said, well, maybe that's, this is Peter. But then others have thought that that doesn't really make much sense because the 11 seem to still be in Jerusalem, and then they return, and they, found out, they find out upon their return that Jesus has appeared to Peter at that point. So, that doesn't exactly seem to fit. So, if it's not Peter then who are some other options? Well, some have suggested that Cleopas had a friend who was traveling with him, or possibly his son was named Simon. There is also an early church tradition that names Cleopas' son as Simon, and uh, so people have said, well, maybe that's who was traveling with him. If the, if the other tradition, saying it was Simon, was him, others have said maybe it was Cleopas' wife. Maybe they had traveled together to Jerusalem. Maybe they were traveling away now, you know, all the other suggestions are men, and some of it having to do with that tradition about it being Simon and everything, but it nowhere tells us that it's two men. It says two disciples. Could be Cleopas and his wife. Could be. Reality is we just don't know. We don't know exactly where Emmaus is. We don't know exactly who was traveling with Cleopas, but we do know that this is the same day that Jesus resurrected and the empty tomb was found. So, as they travel this seven miles to Emmaus, they're talking about everything that's happened. There's still a lot of confusion about what's going on, right? Last week, we saw that there was a ton of confusion until Jesus appeared for Mary Magdalene, right? She continued to think somebody had taken the body away. Even to Jesus himself, thinking it was the gardener, she said, tell me where you've put him and I'll, I'll, I'll get his body, right? And then he says, Mary. So she is, is seriously confused. Everybody is still very confused at this point. They're trying to make sense of this. So they're talking about everything that's happened. Verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and walked with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So now it's three, one of them being Jesus himself, but they don't realize that it's Jesus. For some reason, they're kept from recognizing him. So what does Jesus say? He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? As if he doesn't know. You know, like God asks questions to people sometimes in the Bible. Jesus asks questions. Like, you already know the answer. What are you asking for? You know everything, right? God is omniscient. He is all-knowing, past, present, future. He knows all things. He doesn't have to ask you what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows but sometimes as a matter of conversation, he, he asks people questions. Sometimes he uses questions as a teaching method, and that, that may be along the lines of what he's doing today. What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there 
in these days. So obviously they are confused. They realize that everyone is talking about what's happened. What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Let's pause there for a minute as we sit in their explanation of what's going on, because here we get a picture of the mindset of the disciples after Jesus has been crucified, and they don't know yet that he's been resurrected. First thing that I want you to notice is how they describe Jesus. He says, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful, wor- powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. In some ways, that may seem like a disappointment, right? Like, Jesus is more than a prophet, right? Jesus is the Son of God. Like, there were plenty of prophets before Jesus. Even John the Baptist was a prophet in the mold of the Old Testament prophets. Like, there have been prophets. So, to say that Jesus was a prophet seems, at first, like a disappointment. But they don't really mean it that way, okay? I want you to... We just preached through the book of Mark, right? So, we're, we don't have the foundation that uh, in the Gospel of Luke that we would if we were reading out of Mark and using his language. But I, w- I want you to take my word for it or get out your Bible software when you get home and do a search for the word prophet in the Gospel of Luke, is that Luke has actually emphasized... Jesus as a prophet, uh, being seen by the people as a prophet, and even confirming himself that he is a prophet. In fact, if you go back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a promise and a prophecy that a key prophet, the prophet, would come one day to the nation of Israel. And so Luke writes with that background in mind, saying that Jesus was a prophet, meaning he was this, not exhaustively, I'm not saying that's all he was, but he was a prophet, telling the truth of God, speaking the words of God to the people of God. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our elders, see, he says our elders there, like he's identifying with the nation of Israel. He's Jewish himself. He identifies with our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, even though he doesn't agree with that. He realizes it was done under their authority, and they crucified him. And then verse 21, I think this may be uh, one of the key moments here in this exchange. In fact, this morning, my message centers around three key moments in this, and this is the first of those three key moments. He says, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But those hopes have now been crushed in the minds of these disciples. It seems like he is not the one that's going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was, but now he's been crucified, and we don't even know where his body is. There's been some amazing things happen, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What they don't realize is that it was actually in his crucifixion through which he did redeem his people. He was a prophet. He was going to redeem his people, and he did. But these disciples don't realize it yet. We have the benefit of looking back on this through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of the New Testament, but as they walk down this road today, their hopes had been crushed. Their disappointment was off the scales. And I want you to know today that as they say, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, that this points to the character of God in that he is a God who takes our hurts and disappointments and turns them for his purposes and our good. We have that promise throughout Scripture in so many different ways, in so many different books of the Bible, 
that God takes our disappointments. He takes the times that it looks like everything is a failure. It, he takes the times that everything feels like it's crumbling down. We had hoped that this was going to happen, and it didn't. And now my life is filled with disappointment. And God takes those through the resurrection and the victory of Jesus, and he turns them for the glory of God and for your good. There is reason, if you are disappointed today, if you are crushed, there is reason for hope to remain. We had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. The news is that he did. It's already finished. The victory has already been won. You see, what they didn't realize was that the Old Testament, for a long time, had already been prophesying that the Messiah had to suffer and die that he would be a suffering servant in the concept of the book of Isaiah, for example, or in Psalm 118, which we read earlier in today's service. Let me give you a couple verses out of that passage, remind you of what you heard earlier as Ivan read. It says, I will not die, but live. Think about how that might apply to Jesus. It says, I will not die, but live. And proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Yes, Jesus died, but he wasn't given over to death. He came back out of the tomb. Verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I didn't even know we were going to sing that song today when I was working on this sermon. The stone the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In other words, God has chastened us. He has given us over to where it looks like death was here, like disappointment and hurt and crushing was here. But then he resurrects our hope. He saves us out of this. And the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Let me give you another one. Psalm 69. I've got it marked here in my Bible. You can either listen or if you want to turn there, that's fine too. A few verses out of here. Psalm 69, it says, For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my mother's children. A zeal for your house consumes me. You remember Jesus quoted that and was that verse was fulfilled in him, a zeal for your house when he cleared the temple. And the insults of those who insult you fall on me going to move down a little bit more, verses 14 and 50. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or death swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. In other words, I am being overwhelmed. There is sadness. There is fear. It feels like I'm about to be overwhelmed and drowned in the flood waters. So don't let that happen, God. That's, that's my request. Verse 18, come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. Think about Jesus on the cross. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For com- comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. You hear the picture of Jesus being crucified here? And they had all of this for hundreds of years before Jesus came. Let me give you one more. Isaiah chapter 53, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The nation of Israel had these prophecies. They had these scriptures, but they didn't realize that the Messiah, when he came, he wasn't just going to go straight and sit on a throne. They didn't realize that as he came, he was going to suffer for you and for me and for the nation of Israel, and he was going to do that to redeem the nation of Israel. 
It was through his sufferings that their redemption would happen. It wasn't through his exaltation immediately that it would happen. It was through his sufferings that they would be redeemed. So they were looking for the wrong thing. That's why they had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But now their hopes are crushed. So what happens after that? Verse 25. Back to the Gospel of Luke now. Verse 25. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Right? Because Jesus is remembering all these verses and more that I just gave to you. He knows all of this, and he says, why are you guys missing this? It's been right in front of you for so long. You could have known. You could have expected. And Jesus even knows. I even told you, we're going to Jerusalem, the chief priests. They're going to crucify the Son of Man. He told them again, and they still didn't get it. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In verse 27, here's the next key moment of today's passage. Verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, Jesus takes the Old Testament from beginning to end, and as they walk along the road to Emmaus, he explains, here's what was pointing to me, and here's what was pointing to me, and here's what was pointing to me. Story after story that all point to Jesus. Sometimes you take your Bible, and you open up to read, and you turn to some of these Old Testament passages, and you're like, I don't understand this. This seems really detached and far away from me. The culture is different. The customs are different. The names are really strange. I don't know how to pronounce these. And it seems hard to make a connection at times. I understand that. But I want you to know that the Old Testament is an entire story that's written to tell you about Jesus coming before he arrives. I can imagine what Jesus might have said to them. Obviously, I don't know this. This is my, my idea of what Jesus might have told them. But I think he might have told them of the promise from early in Genesis of how the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And then he would tell them how the Messiah was the one that was going to rescue out of the flood of God's judgment. And then he was going to show them how Abram took his son up to sacrifice him at God's command, but instead... God replaced the sacrifice of Abram's son Isaac with a ram that was caught in a bush. And then he was going to tell him about Moses and how Moses led the first exodus, but the Son of Man was going to come and lead a second exodus out of captivity to sin and into victory, into a new promised land, just like Joshua had. He was going to talk about Israel's desire for a king and how the Son of Man was going to fulfill Israel's desire for a king, but he was going to be far greater than any earthly king that Israel had ever seen. You read the stories in First, Second Kings and Chronicles, and what you read about is failure after failure after failure, and king after king after king. And once in a while, you'll find one that does some good stuff, but even they fail and have flaws. But Jesus is going to fulfill every hope that Israel had for the perfect king who would lead the perfect nation, a kingdom of priests to our God. He explained to them how he was the greatest prophet. He explained how he fulfills the Old Testament temple. He explained how the Old Testament looks forward to the life of the Messiah. And it points to a a Messiah who is suffering for his people. So here's what you have in the Old Testament, okay? As you read your Bible, the Old Testament is looking forward to Jesus. And then you get to a point after Malachi and the beginning of Matthew where you get to the New Testament in your Bibles. Now, these two disciples didn't have the New Testament yet, but we do. And as you read your New Testament, I want you to realize that it is looking back and reflecting on the birth, life, Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. 
So the Old Testament is looking forward to Jesus. The New Testament is looking back on his life. And at the center of it all, you have Jesus himself, the center of all God's revelation to us. His very character is shown to us in Christ. His plan of redemption is shown to us in Christ, and it's confirmed in Christ, and it's, fu- and it's fulfilled and completed in Christ. Both Old Testament and New Testament, looking back at Jesus. So I think this is the kind of thing that Jesus is explaining to them right now. He's explaining to them a theological reading of the Bible. How do you, when you see weird stories about Abram going up on a mountain with his son and taking a knife, and then a God speaking to him and, and telling him not to sacrifice his son, that he would provide a sacrifice instead. You, you can see that story, and it's confusing. Why would God tell Abram to do that in the first place? You know, scary, suspenseful, and then resolved as God provides the sacrifice, you see that all of this is training our minds to see patterns in the way that God works for his people and who Jesus is. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. We are amazingly blessed that we can walk down to the corner store and buy a copy of God's word to open up and read for ourselves. You realize for most of human history that has not been the case. For a long time, you had to have super expensive scrolls or books were handwritten and inaccessible to anybody but the most wealthy people. You even get to a lot of times in the history of the church before the printing press was invented where even the individual church leaders themselves didn't have a copy of the Bible to teach from. And now, through modern technology, when I'm talking about this, I mean the printing press is modern technology. Obviously, we have a lot newer technology than that even now. You can look at it on your smartphone and everything. But how blessed we are that you have a copy for yourself of God's inspired word. He has given this to us, and we are so privileged that we can open up these pages and learn for ourselves about who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit will speak through God's word to you as you read this book. It's absolutely incredible. But you'll read it the wrong way if you don't read that it's about Jesus. It's helping you to know him. And that's the point. The Holy Spirit enlightens us, reveals him to us through the pages of this inspired, infallible, inerrant book that we have access to. And the purpose of it is so that you can know the resurrected Christ. So, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That's the second key moment in in today's passage. Let's Let's see how the story continues. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, farther. I said further at first, but it's farther. You know there's a difference there? You know the difference? I'm not going to explain them right now. Go look it up. <laughs> it can be kind of confusing, but it's kind of interesting if, if you like that kind of thing. They went farther because it's distance. It's not conceptual. Further is concept. Farther is distance. That's the way it works. I said I wasn't going to explain it, but I did anyway. (laughs) Just like Jesus, he said he was going to go on. He didn't go on, right? Uh, So Jesus continued on as as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. So obviously what he's been telling them is compelling, and they want to hear more. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, God, thank you for the bread, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. So in breaking bread and sharing this fellowship meal with each other, which has echoes and similarities of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, 
Jesus gives thanks, breaks the bread. Also of the Last Supper with his, uh, with his disciples. Echoes there, but none, none of those are directly pointed out by Luke in, in the gospel. It just, he gives thanks, he breaks bread, and they're like, this has been Jesus walking along with us all this time and we didn't even recognize him. Then their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Another, another change for the resurrection body, right? He, he can teleport. I mean, it's the, basically the word we would, we would call it. It seems like he already has now, but here it's explicit. He disappeared from their sight after they realized it was him, and, and he's going to do that. He can walk through doors and walls and appear to the disciples in a locked room. You know, we'll be there next week. He, he can do different stuff in the resurrected body. He seems, maybe he looks a little different. We don't, we don't know all the details of it, but I, th- I find this kind of stuff fascinating. So, he disappears from their sight. And then here's the next key moment, the third key moment of today's message. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They were like, we should have known all along. Because as he talked to us and explained the Bible, what we had know is the Bible anyway, the scriptures are, is the word they used. As he explained the scriptures, there was a burning inside of our hearts that we could sense and tell something incredible was happening. And I love that picture of the exposition of Scripture and what God uses it to do in our lives. If you are a child of God here today, meaning, and by, when I say that, I mean if you have trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've given your life to Him and you are a believer and follower of Jesus. He has done that because your, His Word was, was revealed to you. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Faith is inspired in us as we hear God's Word. God takes His Word as you hear it, and He awakens faith within you. It is so important for you to hear the Bible. This is one of the dangers of Christians who stop going to church on a regular basis. They stop hearing the Bible. They stop, they let the Bible sit on the shelf. They don't read it. They don't hear from God's word. Is that faith, if it's not reawakened by the continual catalyst of the scriptures, it declines and slowly dies. But when we hear the word of God, which is one of the reasons that we put such a priority in our church tradition on preaching and hearing God's Word, because that is what God takes and uses in our lives to awaken us, to set our hearts on fire about the goodness of God and the the fullness of the gospel and the hope that we have in Jesus. And you can imagine if you've been six months without being in church and hearing about that, you might hear the name Jesus and you think, oh yeah, I believe in Him. I agree with all that stuff. But maybe your heart doesn't explode in joy and worship because of him. But then when you've gathered with God's people and you've sang songs about Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in his Savior's love, and that I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the crucifixion whereby I was saved, when, when you've been with God's people and you're reminding yourself of that and you're hearing the gospel of Mark and sermons about the resurrection appearances of Jesus and you remember and then you hear about Jesus and suddenly your heart warms and your, your eyes get wide and your hope is felt in a tangible way because of Jesus in his word. Were not our hearts burning within us when he talked about us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I hope that you get at least a small feeling of that as you sit in church and hear God's word preached. You know, I feel like that's part of my job as, as pastors to, is to help facilitate that happen. I want to give you compelling messages from God's word. Like, I know preaching can be boring, I, don't, I want to not bore you with this, okay? You, 
you can sit through a sermon that's too long or not very exciting, and you can halfway fall asleep or maybe fully fall asleep. I see some of you out there. It's like it's I I take responsibility. And I it's it's my job to have something for you from God's word that's well prepared, that connects with you and your current life experience, that explains the scriptures well and faithfully. That I, that's a that's responsibility for me, no doubt. And I want to do that. And I'm sure that there are some Sundays that I do that better than others. And I'm thankful that y'all put up with the ones that it's not as good, okay? But as I preach, as you hear Scripture read from our church members, I hope that you listen and engage well enough so that God can take that in your life and awaken faith in you so that your heart is set on fire for Jesus. What an incredible picture. Were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked about us, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, what if we could be a church full of people whose heart was on fire for God's truth as revealed in the Bible, pointing to Jesus Himself? I love it. So good. Key moment in today's passage, right? Were not our hearts burning within us? Verse thirty-three. They got up. And returned at once to Jerusalem. So they had traveled to Emmaus, and now they're on their way back to Jerusalem because they've got to deliver this news that they have seen Jesus alive. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So they found them back in Jerusalem, saying, The Lord has appeared to Simon. Right? Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. There is all kinds of rejoicing going on today. They're discovering, they're figuring out that the hope they had that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, maybe that was not snuffed out. Maybe that hope is still alive because Jesus is still alive. What would it have been like to be walking on that road to Emmaus? and talk with Jesus, and hear him tell the story about how all the Old Testament was pointing to him and fulfilled in him, what would that have been like? These two disciples, what an incredible experience. What would it have been like to be like Mary last week? Weeping, and then to hear Jesus say your name. What would it be like to be with the disciples in the locked room when Jesus appears? We'll be there next week don't miss it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word, for preserving it, for inspiring it, for giving us revelation that we can trust, and most of all, revelation that points to Jesus himself. And I ask today that no one in this room or watching online would escape today without having seen and come into contact with the presence of Jesus himself. Now we thank you for the hope that's ours that lives and cannot be defeated because of what Jesus has done. For anyone who's here who doesn't know him yet and the hope that he brings, would today be the day of salvation and trust that Jesus has risen for us, for our salvation, for our forgiveness that we can be united with Christ by believing. We ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got one more song to sing, a closing song. We're going to worship Jesus together. Invite you to, to stand with us together while we sing and worship. If there's anyone today who needs to know how to give their life to Jesus for the first time or needs to rededicate their life or needs to just have someone pray for them, we will have some of our church leaders standing in the back Come back and speak to us during this time. You're welcome to do that. The rest of us, let's worship together and sing praises of Christ who's worthy. See yeah.
Amen. Yes. Have a seat just for one more moment. Thanks to Shane, Amy, our band for leading us today. Before we head out today, let me give you just a couple of announcements before you go so that you know what's going on. First of all, one week from today, pretty big Sunday for us. We have a couple different things going on. So this coming Sunday, uh, April 21st, we are starting a new series in our small groups. Uh, so we have a number of options for you that you see on the screen, Growing in Christ uh, in room five, and young adults are also doing that study. Uh, Romans chapters eight and nine, exegetical study in room four with uh, Bert Hickman, uh, Greg Edwards leading the Go- Growing in Christ, and Sarah Hobbs leading the young adults. Uh, then uh, in room two, the women's study, Women of Worth, doing Uh, being an authentic church, and then in the fellowship hall, the invisible war, which is a study on spiritual warfare. I've heard a lot of people excited about that one too. So you are free to continue on in the current small group that you're in, or if you want to shift around and try something new, you're welcome to do that as well. But those are all starting together next Sunday.
And so that gives you the, those options. If you're not currently involved in a small group, we really want you to be involved in one because it's a good opportunity for you to get to know more of our church family, for you to build community, have people to study the Bible with, and also to uh, get to know and walk through life with, be able to pray for each other and uh, develop friendships, those kind of things. That's really important in a church. And small groups are a great way for that to happen. So if you're not currently attending a small group, it starts at 9.30s on Sunday mornings, and uh, they meet for about an hour, and then worship starts at 10.45, as you know, because you're here today. Although some of you may have been not quite here at 10.45. That's all right. We're glad that you're here, even if it was a couple minutes late. Some of you are just getting coffee out there and everything. But also next Sunday, I'm, I'm just talking now. Next Sunday... Uh, small groups, uh, new small groups happening, but we also have a special guest for our worship service. Uh, our good friend, Legend, will be here. He will be preaching, uh, possibly doing some music for us as well. Legend is one of our ministry partners we support on a monthly basis, and, uh, and we are, have developed a great friendship with him, uh, faithfully preaching God's Word to us, and you will not want to miss it. It's going to be a great Sunday. Next Sunday, uh, April 21st, uh, for worship. Legend will be here preaching, and, uh, and you won't want to miss it. All right? Let's see what else do we have up there. This coming Thursday night, we're hosting the Bridge Network meeting that's here, so that doesn't apply to everyone, although you're certainly welcome to come if you would like to. Uh, there's a dinner at 6 p.m. If you want to take part in that, please let us know so that we make sure we have a reservation for you. And then if you would like to help and volunteer, we have a volunteer sign-up sheet that's online. Uh, for setup, for greeters, for helping serve food, for cleanup, for a tech team. And we have some of those slots filled, but we need some more. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do that. If you don't know how to sign up, uh, we sent that through the Church Center app. If you don't know how to get there, uh, let me or Karen know uh, or any of our elders, and we'll, we'll get you connected with how to get signed up so that we'll know that you're going to help in those different ways. Uh, Youth Friday night, you've got a 122 coming up. You see the new small group series, Legend Preaching, uh, Baby Shower for Amy coming up the 21st too. That's going to be a full day. Lots of stuff going on there. Children's Movie Night coming up, membership class on the 28th if you're interested in uh, joining New Song or finding out more about that. Uh, make plans to stay after on April 28th. We'll have lunch and, uh, and help you get to know our church a little bit better, okay? We'll, be, we'll have a sign up for that for you next week if you want to participate, all right? Uh, for giving options, you have newsong.live slash give. Uh, the Church Center app, you can use that, or you can use the white boxes that are by the doors as you exit today. Also, if you're a guest today and filled out one of those guest information cards, or uh, if you have a prayer request and filled out one of the green cards, place those in those white boxes as well. All right? I think that, that's everything for today. So thankful for you. If you're staying for tech team training, that's after church today. Just stick around here in the worship center, and we'll get started uh, with that in about 10 or 15 minutes after the service is over. And I want to send you out today with our benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. It says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The grace of our Lord be with you. Amen.